Hey y'all, I'm Brooke Hoover, a Louisiana native, actor, writer, and comedian. I've lost 100 pounds through diet and exercise, or shall I say, lifestyle changes. My 20 year and counting health journey has taught me that just like taking a diet pill for weight loss, body positivity doesn't magically happen overnight. I'm working on regaining my self-esteem and rekindling my love affair with Cajun and Southern comfort food in a healthier way, all the while juggling eating as clean as I can, reestablishing myself in the entertainment industry, which, as we know, is historically fat-phobic, all the while showing my inner fat girl some love. That's fat with a PH. Pretty hot and tempting. Let me tell y'all a tale or two. Hey y'all, this is Brooke with the Who's Dat Fat Girl podcast, and actually today is the first day that I am videotaping this. I'm adding another component to it. Uh, A few people suggested it, and I'm like, oh gosh, yet again another thing to add to my plate that's already full, and you know, the production value is suffering obviously because I my first and foremost, my goal is to make my listeners happy. So I have a very soundproof room and it's my closet. See, there's my padded bras. So this video, it's just my face. It's just a talking head, but this is for people who might want to see my face. I don't know. Um, might want to see that sometimes I'm sniffing rosemary oil and things like that to help me focus. So anyways, here we go with today's episode. And it's called, in honor of Jim Carrey, Smokin'. Oh, I think that, see, this is why I don't videotape these, because I just noticed that the audio level got way too high. So let's take that again. Smokin'. Yes. Yes. This is a warning for family members and or friends and or people who are out there who judge smokers and or former smokers. You may not like what you're about to hear. Um, or read for my people who read the transcripts, but please stay with me to the end, y'all. The ending is happy. So newsflash, I'm a former smoker. I'm not proud of it. I'm not proud that I smoked for almost half of my life, but I'm proud that I quit. So before I tell y'all how I did it and what worked and what didn't work for me, let's get into the mind of a smoker or at least a 15-year-old smoker, yes, a 15-year-old smoker who just wants to feel cool and may have found the secret to weight loss, or so she thought. Summer, late 1980s, Cashers, North Carolina. We're on vacation. Therefore, my dad, a.k.a. Hoover Bob, whips out his alter ego, which is not much different than regular Bob, except he smokes. Cigars. Swisher Sweets. And I just love sitting on the deck with him watching the cigar burn down to his thick fingers before blowing and cursing them out. Sorry, I had to throw in that Cheryl Crow reference there. And while I'm not a fan of the cigar smell, I still am not a fan of the cigar smell. Ugh. I love tapping the cigar ash into the ashtray for him. Now, Before y'all judge hardcore, this was the 80s in the mountains of North Carolina. Before we had the internet, hell, we only had like three really good, really good, meaning not fuzzy ants flashing television channels from a satellite. And I'd burn through, pun intended, my summer reading because I was a good girl. And uh, yeah, a good girl who loved playing with burning cigars. So flash forward a few years to the mid-1990s. Those were the years of our French exchange student friends. And of course, they all smoked. Bien sûr. Lucky strikes. And they all looked très cool, or so I thought. But they wouldn't give me one because it is a disgusting habit and you are too young. Too young. We were all the same age. Fifteen. Kaz, Kaz, that's 15. I think I just heard my mom's phone go off. I really don't want to edit the sound on that, but I might have to. Anyways, oh, and of course, Mama, speaking of the devil, Mama smoked too. She ended up quitting too, like me, but more on that later. But she always said, just like the French people did, it's a disgusting habit, baby. Don't you ever do it. I wish I could quit. As she took a puff of her Carlton Menthol 100, but 
She did try to quit several times, including one time when she was prescribed a nicotine patch from the doctor, and it just made her super, super racy, so much so that she had to jump into a cold shower. So I was like, that's not good. This is what my um, teacher, Coach Coco, bless him, he's in heaven. He used to say, that's not good, but that's not good. The stuff that's supposed to help you is as bad as the stuff that got you there in the first place. So I think what enticed me to smoking the most wasn't that I was surrounded by it, surrounded by people telling me it was a bad habit as they took a drag, but I should say surrounded actually might not be the best word because Ann and Bob, my mom and dad, were polite smokers because they smoked outside only or they held their cigarette way far out of the car window. It wasn't even the ads that made smoking look cool. It wasn't even the old wives' tale that smoking keeps you skinny or makes you skinny is what my mind heard. More on that later again, y'all. It wasn't even the Virginia Slim's points that got you the cool stuff. What got me really into smoking was the NC-17 rated movie, Kids. So one day I was just watching the movie in my room and all the kids, kids and kids, were smoking so I was like, this looks cool. So I went and stole a pack of my mama's Carlton Menthol 100s ugh, and started smoking my heart out. Probably literally, literally. My mama must have smelled, uh, my mama must have smelled disgusting. No, mama actually never smelled disgusting. That's not nice. My room must have smelled disgusting. And I had like the worst headache and I had dry mouth, but I felt so cool. And, and, I didn't want to eat. It, it fixed that fixation for me. But I knew a girl couldn't exist on Carlton Menthol 100s alone. So my mom's best friend, ex-best friend, she would leave Virginia Slims in her mailbox for me. A carton in the mailbox every Friday. Virginia Slims, we all know there's a nickname for them, but I'm too much of a lady to say that nickname. It would be really funny if I could burp on command now after I just said that I'm a lady, but I'm not that talented. But I did get a really sweet Zebra's director chair and set of faux tortoise shell bracelets from smoking enough, though, getting those Virginia Slims points. So that was kind of cool. And then one day, my mama caught me red-handed. Well, more like yellow, dried, funky index finger. I mean, that's what happens if you smoke y'all you know um and all I remember her saying is Brooke Ann you better quit right now because you'll never be able to quit if you keep going but that was poor timing because that's when I got in my driver's license my mom and dad gave me a 1992 Jeep Cherokee so I had freedom and I could smoke whenever I wanted I mean so long as I Febreze the hell out of myself before I saw mama or dad because a smoker or a former smoker especially, can always smell the smell of a smoker. Are y'all with me? So I did a pretty stealthy job at hiding the smoking from Mama. Um, after that one time I got caught, I made her think that was like, oh, that was the only time, that was a one-time thing, and it's not going to happen again. I hid it from my dad. I hid it from my family members, and I hid it from some school teachers. Basically, I hid smoking from anyone of authority. But I especially, I did not want my aunt, my nanny, to find out. And aunt, we actually call back home in Louisiana, if your aunt is also your godmother, you just call her nanny. Makes it a lot, lot easier. So nanny finding out that'd be even worse than mama or dad because they were smokers or part-time cigar smokers so they kind of uh, got it I guess but not nanny so one day I was driving down Drusilla Lane listening to the soundtrack from Pulp Fiction most likely and because this wasn't an area where a lot of family or friends lived I thought I could just roll down the windows of my 92 Jeep and have a cig. So I'm rolling down listening to that song, girl, you'll be a woman soon. And all of a sudden I see a white Mercury SUV and a lady that looks like my mom or, well, she looks like my aunt as if my aunt and my mom look together, look, look, my aunt and my mom look alike. And then I realize, 
I think that is my aunt. And I just keep telling myself, no, it's not nanny. It's not nanny. It's not nanny. It's okay. Take another drag. You'll be okay. And see, again, not only is my aunt really against smoking, she's also a dental hygienist. So she's like really, really, really against smoking for your physical health, for your moral well-being, and for your dental hygiene. But that, you know, I lost my place. So she turns and looks at me and she does a double take, a double take better than any double take I've ever seen in any comedic film or movie. And I just kept telling myself, it's not her. It's not her. It's not her. I'm 99.9% .9 sure it was her. We never spoke about it. Sorry, nanny. But that still didn't stop me from smoking. It was almost like the secrecy kept me wanting more in some sick way. So one day, it was, I think, either junior or senior year of high school. I know. I started smoking early. Yes. My friends, Hoover Bob, my dad and I all went to eat at Outback Steakhouse. And, of course, they have a very long wait. So we have to take one of those pager things. And we're waiting. We're killing time. I'm, like, rolling around on the grass or something, as usual. And my purse falls and all of its contents spill out, including my Virginia Slims. And so my dad, Hoover Bob, comes up to me. And I think he's going to make me eat the pack of cigarettes like... His dad, Papa, once made him and his brother David do when they were younger and had tried smoking in, a, in an attempt to make them not smoke again. But sorry, Papa, it didn't work. And all my dad says to me is, Brooke, I saw those cigarettes. And I'm like tasting the cigarettes in my mouth already, like eating them, feeling that nicotine and stuff in my system like he's going to make me eat them. And I'm really just really wanting to eat some Alice Springs chicken. But my dad continues, Brooke, you better let me bum a couple. But really, girl, you should stop that shit. So I keep smoking through high school. I get out of South Louisiana and high school almost unscathed and undiscovered in my smoking endeavors. Actually, except for one time. When we were driving down to New Orleans for Mardi Gras with my best friend and my mom's ex-best friend, and I was smoking out the car window. I don't know why I'm still <laughs> after like I'm, I'm pretending that I'm smoking here. I'm smoking out the car window, and some people from my high school, like not just like students, but like moms, they drove by and they stared at us in shock. And so smoking had become like so second nature to me, like. I didn't quite let their looks affect me or phase me, you know? So a few months after that, on a school trip to Spain, this trip leader, whoever he's called, the ringleader, he pulls me aside and he's like, not really the type of guy you want to pull you aside because he's like really touchy feely and he's way more emotional than any person ought to be on a trip to Spain, especially. And he's like, Brooke, I'm actually surprised you turned out to be a good egg. I was warned by some of the parents that you're a smoker and a bad seed. But I know you're not. He opens his arms. Hug it out. And I give him this like weird half-ass hug. And I then found my two bad seed friends and we went and smoked in an alleyway. <sighs> so now it's college time and everyone in the theater department smokes. It's just, that's what we do. It's a ritual. We all smoke. Even right before we have to do this thing called Suzuki. And it's not like Suzuki, like the motorcycle. It's not Suzuki, even like the music technique. It's a physical theater training where you basically have to stomp your heart out. You're sweating like a, a bucket of sweat to this like hardcore Japanese music. And then you fall on the ground and you walk forward like a mystical being. And sometimes a stick happens and you hit statues and stuff. It's like really important theater stuff. But so we did this after smoking cigarettes. I don't know how we did this. Oh, and yes, let me mention, if we haven't been following along in my journey throughout all of this whole podcast, everything, this is at the point in time where I was about 250 pounds. 
See, the cigarettes didn't help me lose weight like I thought they would. So I don't, I honestly, I don't know how I didn't give myself a heart attack. <laughs> Thank you, God. I'm giving myself the sign of the cross for my podcast listeners. After college, I still smoked, but one of my best friends, he was really trying to quit. And I told him, like, I didn't really want to. I was like, but B, I'm so afraid to quit because it'll make me gain weight. And he's like, B, that's a common misconception. You know, smoking doesn't help you lose weight. It just keeps you stagnant. So while it may prevent you from gaining more weight, it's also keeping you stationary in one spot. And my name is Brooke for a reason. You know what I mean? Like, Brooke, the noun, flows, moves, keeps it flowing. And this was also around the time I was really into, like, law of attraction. I still am. Um, and my hippy-dippy stuff. Still am. Sniffing my essential oils and just, I was really into feeling the flow. So this idea that my friend B, that's his nickname, B, we call each other B, was the most viable for me to understand. And it was around the time I was doing the South Beach diet principles and I was just trying to be healthier, change my body. But all of this thought and grasping this concept, it really just made me want one more cigarette. And I mean, the cigarettes, y'all, they were like my friend on long car rides. They were the reward from huffing it into the city from Brooklyn, I, I would like get to my destination and have a cigarette, I would, ignoring the fact that I'm huffing up the steps from the F train. I thought cigarettes were a friend of mine. They weren't. They were just controlling me. One of the things I can't stand about myself is that sometimes it, it really takes a come to Jesus moment for me to change behavior and the case in point with smoking. So one day I had a job interview for a real job, non-acting job. I hate how I have to be like real job, air quotes, at a popular television show working in their archives department. Steady gig, pretty good pay, health insurance. I was celebrating the awesome job interview with a cigarette outside of Rockefeller Center. Ooh, did I just give away where I was? Ooh, the television um, channel. Anyways, I just get like this weird feeling in my body as I'm taking the subway and the PATH train home to Jersey. <sighs> home to Jersey. That sounds funny. And it, it's that something's not right with mama. I just feel it in my gut. And something wasn't right with mama. While I was pretty much trying to secure a job with room for growth, mama was being rushed to the emergency room. The ambulance was going down the winding roads of Lake Toxaway, North Carolina. Mama had had a horrible asthma attack that made her oxygen level plummet. It plummeted so much that it could have caused brain damage. We were worried not just about, we were worried about her surviving. We were worried about her heart. We were worried that if she did survive, would she still have mental capacity? Yeah. So mama's an asthma patient and a smoker. Not good. That's not good, Coach Coco. Y'all remember that? That's what we call a call back. Anyways, it's, it's no laughing matter. I was on the flight the next morning down to the hospital in Asheville, North Carolina. And thankfully, long story short, I mean, long story long, Mama, because she's a sturdy Cajun woman, she bounced back after about two months. She had to go through a lot of um, additional procedures and therapies. And we both looked at, at each other and said, yeah, yeah, maybe we should stop smoking. So we stopped smoking cold turkey. I ate a lot of ginger and wasabi with my sushi before improv rehearsals. I was almost addicted to that and the sushi and the wasabi and the whole ritual of it. And my good friend from improv told me that that was probably helping with the smoking cessation. I was so proud. And then I got a gig working on Boardwalk Empire. And we had to smoke those fake cigarettes. I mean, we didn't have to. I volunteered because they're fake, right? Yeah, that was like the gateway drug because the fake cigarettes are so bad. I told myself that I had to smoke the real thing to counteract the fake ones. And this time, what I was smoking wasn't Virginia Slims. It was American Spirits. Oh, and I should mention before that, in college, we smoked Parliaments. Those um, we call them P-Funks with the recessed filters. Oh, gosh. In a sick way, I kind of miss it. Just just the recessed filters and the blue. That's it. But anyways, 
Boardwalk Empire, I'm smoking American spirits because, hello, they're natural and eco-friendly. I mean, they even sell me seed packets on my birthday. They're like the good guys. Yeah, right. I tried knitting to quit, but then after making a lot of progress knitting, it made me just want to have another cigarette. And simultaneously down in North Carolina, Mama had started smoking again, too. So Mama then moved up with me here to New Jersey, and we were like the smoking duo. And I must say, it feels weird to be an adult child and to smoke with your parent. But we did until Christmas Eve 2012, when Mama starts having another asthma attack. And my boyfriend Harry and I rush her to the emergency room. And people still to this day do not understand the severity of asthma. And Mama's just slowly losing oxygen to her brain like we could tell. And Harry, my boyfriend, still tells the story to this day that she was like turning gray. I was freaked out. He was more in check. And he was on top of it enough to tell a little bit of a fib and say to the people in the emergency room, bring this lady right back now. She's having a heart attack. And I'm glad he told a little fib. I will be forever grateful to Mr. Harry because those seconds count when someone is literally losing their breath. Oh, I didn't think I was going to cry. No, I'm just, just a little, just a little vacillant. Grateful. I'm grateful. So after seeing mama in the hospital again, we damn well know that a third time will not be a charm. So mama officially quit cold turkey and she never has had one again. Thank you, God. I did. It wasn't quite that easy for me. I still worried about like quitting smoking. Um, how would I handle that mouth to hand connection? I worried that I would start overeating again because I had started losing weight. I was on a good track with that, but I knew I couldn't keep smoking because it wasn't good for my health. It was too tempting for mama. It literally would kill us. And besides all smokers know that it's not good for them. It's just, when's that moment going to happen that you finally quit? And I really sincerely hope that me telling my long-winded tale helps others quit or it helps loved ones of smokers maybe have some compassion in order to send the good vibes to help those loved ones quit. I mean, I've, I felt like a fraud, basically, for condoning clean eating and exercise, but here I am still smoking. Again, it was the organic, quote-unquote, organic American spirit ones. Anyways, one day we're in Jack's 99-cent store in Mid Midtown Manhattan, and I come across this little homeopathy kit, this little blue kit by Boiron. I hope I'm pronouncing it white, white right, Boiron. They make a lot of homeopathy things, and it was on sale for under $10. And it said it was homeopathy to quit smoking. And I said, why don't I try it? And y'all know what? Putting those little pills under my mouth, under two weeks, it worked like a charm. Now, ironically, or actually maybe not ironically because it's like a medical fact, my right index finger and fingernail got less yellow and dry. My, my skin got better. My body changed and I lost more weight. Not that the like weight part matters, matters. I got healthier. I added years to my life. Mama added years to her life. I had moved myself out of this scared stagnation of needing something that wasn't good for me. We could take that as a metaphor or not. So like all the other former smokers or the former quitters or the, the quitters, the good quitters, I should say, I was disgusted, and I still am, by the smell of cigarette smoke. And I think that's a good thing. So y'all, something that only cost me $9.99 at Jack's 99 cent store, it was able to help save me from something that was going to cost me my life. Ah, you see what I did there? Feeling it. That's a good, that's a good ending. Thanks for listening, y'all. Thanks so much for listening, y'all. It is my hope to inspire, uplift, and entertain you with this Who's Dat Fat Girl podcast. So 
If you're hungry for more, you can book me to speak or perform my solo show that inspired this podcast, Fat Girl Costumes, written by yours truly and directed by Brian Lady at your virtual or in-person event. Please visit brookhoover.com slash fluffybuttproductions or email me at contactbrookhoover at gmail.com for more info. And let's follow each other on Instagram. I'm at Brooke Hoover. And the O's in my name are not the letter O. They're zeros. Not because I want to be a size zero, but because I guess I'm just so clever with my late 90s Yahoo self. And if you like this podcast, which I really hope you do, please give me a five-star rating and write a review on Apple Podcasts. And most importantly, share this with your friends, family, and other people you may know who are as fat as we are. That's fat with a PH.